So guys, I've got to make some moves. I got to clear some space, downsize on my stuff. One thing that I really want to do is get this grinder out of my way. It's sitting on the floor. I need to figure out, is it good or is it bad? And in order to do that, because if it's good, the blue one's going away. The one that's on the, I don't know, probably the left side of your screen, it's gonna go away if this grinder is good, but I can't know that, or at least I don't believe that I can until I can get this grinder off of this floppy wood pallet and get it on the ground. That way I can do some test grinding with it and just you know, see if it's any good or not. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna try to get this over 2,000 pound, well over 2,000 pound, I believe, probably 22, 2,300 pound, grinder off of this pallet by myself. Why by myself? Because I'm kind of hard-headed. I've got a neighbor who's offered several times to help me get this off, but when he's free, I'm not. And when I'm free, he's not. And I'm not the guy to ask for help if I can do something myself. So I'm gonna get myself into a horribly precarious situation with this and then run down there probably and ask if he can you know, help me get this thing the rest of the way off before it falls over on the floor. What's the worst that can happen? Let's see if we can get this off this pallet. So there's been a lot of guys in this situation that I'm in right here. You get a big piece of heavy equipment like this, you get it in your shop, it's on a wooden pallet, and your roof's not strong enough to lift it. You may not have any uh, you know, equipment around to lift it, big tractors, whatever. You may not have access to anything like that, and you're kind of stuck. So what I think that I'm gonna do is, uh, and you don't want to pay a rigging crew. You can pay those guys, but man, it's expensive to have them come out. And I think, I'm rolling the dice here, that I can get this off of this pallet without causing any major damage to the machine or fatalities. We'll see. Um, the plan here is to use cribbing to get this off. Chainsaw, cribbing, toe jacks, you'll get the idea. Let me, uh, let me show you. Get you down here we'll run through the plan super quick and then start getting this thing on you know on the ground hopefully one way or another it's going on the ground so the plan here is actually pretty simple i thought about this for a little while now what i'm going to do is take my chainsaw i'm going to cut out a chunk out in the very center of this grinder where i can install my toe jack under there i'm going to lift this grinder up then i'm going to cut out a section around the feet so I can put my cribbing underneath the feet. I'm gonna set this thing back down on the cribbing, go to the back and do the exact same thing. And then this grinder will be sitting on the cribbing. I can remove the pallet out from under it and then use my toe jack back and forth, removing a little bit of cribbing at a time until I get this thing on the, on the ground. Um, that's the plan. So hopefully it will work. Uh, we will soon find out. So a person could get into trouble real quick. So I've got to think about every move that I make. Get this thing off here. I'm gonna install some cribbing right here underneath this beam before I cut it in two, because it could collapse and this lumber could cave in and then this thing could fall forward. So we don't want that. So I'm gonna install some cribbing under this, cut my chunk out, and then put my jack under there, lift it up, cut out from under the feet and install the cribbing under there. That is the plan. So I love this little electric chainsaw. By the time this five amp hour battery is ran down, yeah, I'm ready for a break anyway. If you're just cleaning up around the yard, these are awesome. They do cut, or at least this one cuts a lot slower than a gas saw, but you know, if you're just cleaning up around the yard, like I say, it's, it's perfect. Not hitting any nails. Yep. I knew that would. Oh yeah, no problem. 
So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I forgot I need to move this thing out a little bit. So I got some room to work back there. So this will just barely lift this thing. Oh man, we're committed now. So Cora decided she wanted to go outside. I don't blame her. This kind of stuff's a little bit nerve-wracking. Hmm. Decided so, you want to come back in? Can you trust me? So now that I've got the pallet cut out from under this thing, it wasn't too bad. It took me a, know, a good hour to, to do it. I had to be very careful on where I cut and when I cut and how I did it. But we got it perched on the, on the cribbing, I guess you'd call it now. And I need to adjust this cribbing. 
because I've got big blocks under it now, just for stability while I'm cutting everything, now I need to reduce the thickness of the blocks. That's why I cut a bunch of pieces of three quarter inch plywood. So I'm gonna jack this thing up and replace some of these big blocks with these smaller blocks. That way I can lower this thing down a three quarter inch piece of plywood on each end at a time to reduce the angle that this thing's at. You know, reduce the likelihood of it tipping or spitting out the blocks and uh, falling. So that's the reason for the thinner plywood is so I have smaller increments to drop this thing down. I just got to get them under it. Oh, I've got two hands. I can pet a dog with one and sweep with the other, can't I? You've got, you've got wood chips in your ear. So I would call that a win. Getting this off the pallet has been on my mind for every bit of a month or better I've known I've had to do it and every time that my buddy's been free I've always had stuff in, either stuff in the way or I haven't been available because he's got some equipment he could have come in here and you know a backhoe or something and you know maybe lifted it uh, lifted it off that pallet but this is not the easiest machine to lift because it has no lift points up top it really if you look at the manual it requires a sling up front that has hooks that hook in these front pockets on each side. And then on the back, you take a sling around the base is what the manual suggests. So two slings of the right length or two really heavy ratchet straps that you can adjust. And then you'd have to hook pretty high and then you know lift. It'd kind of be a pain to get this, to lift it off the pallet given my roof height and, and all that stuff. So I decided I would do it myself and I'm glad that I'd done, that I'd done it. Now that I've got this machine down on the ground, I need to pull it back into position, at least its temporary position, about three feet back, so it's out of my way a bit. And I don't have anywhere to move this, actually, because I can't push it, even though I got it on my rollers. It's way too heavy for that. So I'm going to do what I normally do, and that is just set a concrete anchor in the floor right up next to the wall where it's out of the way, not a tripping hazard or anything. And that way I can hook to it, hook a chain to it, hook come along to that, and then pull it. I've done that pretty much moved all of the heavy stuff in this shop into position with concrete anchors set in the floor. 3 8 16 that's what I'm going to use. Plenty big enough to, uh, well, that won't go on the drill. Plenty big enough to pull any piece of equipment that I've got in this shop. Viewers sent me these concrete uh, drills. Appreciate that. I did not have a set. Just random assortments all I had. So I appreciate that. It's the first time I've used it. And I'm going to use this Bosch Bulldog Extreme Max concrete drill that I bought when I was refurbing this shop. This has been excellent to have. You can drill concrete with your standard, like the DeWalt regular drill. They've got a hammer function and it kind of works. It's better than nothing, but it's not a real hammer drill. This, you know, is a real hammer drill.
So oil quality, since the production of this machine has went just way up, the quality of this oil is probably better than any oil that was designed to operate with. So this machine is now level. Actually, it's only level in the world of construction, cabinetry. In the world of machining, it's, it's not. It's close enough to do what I need to do, and I, and I think that's gonna be uh, just fine, actually. Now, I pulled the coolant system off of my old machine. Now, this is a completely shop-made coolant system, almost completely other than the pump. And I, while I install that, I'm just gonna put it on here so it serves my needs at the moment. I'm not gonna try to permanently install this thing. And as I'm installing it, I wanna show some of you guys my coolant system. So if you wanna replicate or modify or you know, whatever, what I've done to suit you, uh, then you know, you'll see what I've done. So. Let's, uh, let's quickly blast this coolant system on here. I had to clean it out. It was pretty dirty. It was time. And, uh, and we'll mix up some coolant, fill it up, and we'll grind this chuck in and grind some test blocks. I am super interested to see if this works. So just a piece of pipe and a valve there with a tube fitting, compression fitting on it. And I'm just going to cable tie or uh, band clamp this to this holder real quick. It needs to put coolant on the other side of the wheel because it flows that way. So I am going to just bend a piece of tubing underneath the spindle and around. Uh, but right now, this is the quickest way just to get this thing operational. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing. So I'm going to get this on here. And then this will go here. And I'll just bend another piece of quarter, three-eighths copper around, smash the end, and make it to where it goes under the feed side of the wheel. So let me quickly show you the components of this uh, coolant system. So we've got a filter sock here. You can pick these up from McMaster Car. We've got a shop built tank. This is just eighth inch plate. This is four inch pipe, just welded on for an inlet. And then we've got an outlet down here at the bottom. So what happens is this is the coolant flow from the machine. It flows down into the tank, but it flows first into this filter sock that is down into this tank, that filters out any uh, grinding dust or grinding wheel material. And that way when it goes back up to the spray nozzle, it's been filtered. So you can pick these up. And all I do is just jam this down in the tank. I washed this out, but coolant systems are nasty. The only time they're not nasty is when they're brand new. So we wash this thing out a bit. So this just gets jammed down in here like so. This gets folded over like that. Ever so often you have to pull this out. Depending on the amount of grinding that you do or machining, whatever you're using the system for, you'll have to clean out the chips or that get pulled down in here or the grinding grit. But the sock will keep it all contained and you can just pull this out, you know, flip it inside out, clean it out, flush it out, and then reinstall it. That's what I do. It has worked excellent for me. Man, I'm getting filthy. And uh, my return hose, that's just from a, literally it's from a vacuum cleaner. So, there we go. That is a quick look at uh, the tank and the hose. And then the pump, this is a little large. It's a little centrifugal pump, but I've got uh, a bypass. So it circulates coolant inside the tank all the time from the pump. And then it's got uh, a uh, one leg that runs up to the spray nozzle. You know, and you can just, you could put a valve on here to regulate your amount of bypass if your pump was too big, like it is in my case. But I'd rather have a pump that's a little big than a pump that's too small. So 
uh, you can really uh, get uh, a pretty pretty heavy spray with this thing if you if you need that so that's a look at my coolant system it's really nothing special three eighths flexible line vacuum hose shot belt tank a filter sock from mcmaster the rest of it's hardware store stuff so really pretty basic unit but it i've been really happy with it So because I always get several people that ask, this is the cutting oil that I like to use. It's solutions. You can use it for sawing. You can use it for grinding. You can use it for machining. I like to mix it 10 to 1. Stuff doesn't stink. It seems to stay in solution really good, and I like it. So that's what I'm using, mixing it 10 to 1. All right, so here's the system all together. So we've got our reservoir, we've got our return from the machine line, we've got our filter, we've got our pump, we've got our tank outlet that goes into the pump. The pump pushes fluid out and through this line up to the grinder head. But because this pump is larger than what is really required for the coolant flow that I need at the moment, we've got a T here and this tees off and runs right back in to the uh, to the inlet of the tank. So even if I turn the valve off up at the grinder head, the fluid still just travels this way. Now, if you needed more pressure up at the grinding head, you could put a, like a, a large needle valve here or, or a, like a ball valve or, or a plug valve or something and just uh, regulate how much return you let go back to the tank and that will uh, determine your outlet pressure up to the grinder head or to your nozzle. So check that out. What they did here, pretty neat idea. They drilled and tapped the side of the mag chuck, and that way they can put this diamond nib holder on the side of the chuck, and you don't have to turn your magnet on and off in order to dress your wheel. You know, you just go out to the extreme, and then, you know, go across the diamond. I thought that's pretty cool. If I would have made this, I would have tilted the diamond. You can see that on most of your holders, the diamond is not straight. You want it to go away from the rotation of the wheel a bit. That way it kind of acts uh, to sharpen the diamond a bit and not just work right on the tip. You can see this one's just 90 degrees. So the only place this diamond is ever going to touch is right on the very sharp end. And that would probably dull it a lot quicker 
than coming at it to, at an angle. So I may remake this at an angle, but for now it's, it's pretty neat. So you can move it out of the way, do your grinding. You can still have your part stuck to the chuck and you don't have to stick that to it, you know, and re-situate, just put, pull that up, you know, tighten it down, dress your wheel, you know, boom. Kind of, kind of neat. I would refine it a bit, but kind of neat. So that's not gonna work. I gotta come up with something better than that. It's gonna make an absolute mess. My temporary solution, just a piece of rubber. Get on there. Magnet. That will help. How about now? Better. Not perfect but better. An automatic grinder is the only way to go. I could not imagine. Well, I can because I've done it. Cranking these handles just constantly. It will wear you out quickly. So I could spend literally all day grinding in this rough chuck trying to get a nice perfect finish on it, but really I don't care what the finish is, I just care if it's flat. Um, and I think that it's going to be flat enough, I'm hoping that it's going to be flat enough to do the tests that I want to do. So I've got six blocks here and they are they have a stamp on them, one through six, and what I'm going to do is put a block on each corner and two blocks on the middle. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll grind them, I'll take them to the surface plate, I'll check them with a tense indicator, and that will tell me if this thing, you know, if, if there's any difference in between these blocks, I'll know where it's at based on the number of the block and where I put it. So that's kind of the idea. You know, this is just a quick and dirty test. You know, I could do a, a you know, much more thorough job, I think, but this will give me a pretty good idea of what's going on here.
Nope, you gotta turn on the mag chuck. So there's our test blocks that we ground, one through six. Bring you in, get you a little closer here in just a second. This is a tenths indicator. So each little tick mark is a tenth of a thousandth of an inch. A small amount. So that's zero on block one, which is our uh, far left hand back corner. Zero, two, uh, that is no difference, basically. One, two, and three. Zero. That's good. Very good. Is that that's center right there? There's the. Uh, this is the closest to the operator center block number four. Zero again. So this is yeah number five, which is the far back left hand corner. Let's get some under it. Half a tenth. It does feel like it has something dragging though. Dust it off with the precision stone. Yeah. Eh, let's just Let's say half a tenth, far back right hand corner. And then the front uh, right hand corner. I'm super impressed so far. Zero, basically zero. Man, that machine is accurate. So I love my little Harbor Freight bandsaw. I know a lot of you guys have it. I use, it's one of my most used pieces of equipment in the shop. If I wanna cut something super quick and it's small, boom, I go to this saw. It uses the least amount of energy. It's right here, it's lightweight. You know, I can cut vertical or horizontal with it. Just a super handy little saw. And probably a year or so ago, I picked up, I guess, I guess you'd call it an accessory for this. Some of you, I'm sure, know this exists, and some of you may not, and uh, I want to share it with you because I think that it's super neat. I picked mine up for ceramics and stuff, but you could use it for glass and, and other things, but let me share with you what I got. So what I picked up is a diamond blade for this saw. Lots of people sell them, so I'm not going to try to give out a part number or anything, but just look up diamond saw for the or diamond blade for the Harbor Freight band saw on the Google machine, and you will find one to fit your model. Really neat. Not crazy expensive either. Super handy if you're doing ceramics or just anything that's super hard, glass, stuff like that. In fact, I'm going to cut a bottle in two. I'm going to share that with you. So I pulled this bottle out of the tree row. It is a Welch's Sparkling Grape Soda Bottle, probably from the 80s. Uh, a lot of you guys may remember these with the foam label. As kids, we used to pull this label down where it stuck off the bottom a bit and then smack it real hard and it would pop like a sandwich bag, making our friends jump and us laugh. I 
remember doing that all the time. I'm going to attempt to cut this in half, although there are better ways just to show this diamond saw working. Diamond blade. Away you go. So now we have a not so cool, unless you think of that it is, pencil holder or a small glass funnel, or we have both. So the Brown and Sharp MicroMaster surface grinder, it's a keeper. Uh, been wanting to get that thing off the pallet, run it through its paces for several weeks now. I just haven't, I haven't had the time. I've been super busy between my family life that I try to have, uh, my day job and everything else. Just haven't had the time to do it, but I did. I took the time, got it off the pallet, mocked up a coolant system on it, reground or just ground the chuck in. I had to get a coolant system on there to accurately grind that chuck in or to have the best chance to get an accurate grind on that chuck. I've never had I've never had any luck trying to grind a surface grinder chuck dry. They just heat up so fast and then you know you get an inaccurate surface. So I knew that if I was going to test it, I had to test it with a coolant system on it. So ground these test blocks and shocked really shocked that it is as accurate as it is. I was expecting a couple tenths or more. Because of the condition of the chuck when it showed up, I thought, heck, this machine's probably just me assuming, well, you know what you get for assuming, that the grinder had been used for precision work when it was new. It's not a, it's not a young machine. That thing's been around for a while. I assumed, because it had a big belly war in it, if you watched some of the previous videos on it, you, you, you know, I may have uh, touched uh, or pointed that out. I assumed that it got used for precision work for years of its life and then got demoted because it lost accuracy into a rough rough grinder because that's what it was being used for before it got here. So I am shocked to see that it ground these blocks within an, within a tenth of each other and I'm sure that if I'm sure that if somebody took the time to reground the bottom of the surface uh, the mag chuck, regrind the top of the table, took more time to grind those blocks than what I did. I'm sure you could probably get more accurate work than, than what I did. Uh, plus, it gives a better finish than the other machine. It's more accurate than the other machine. So needless to say, the blue grinder is gonna be leaving. And, and I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that because I really like that MicroMaster machine much better than the Kent grinder. It's just a, you know, a whole nother level of quality. So that is it for this week anyway. Thank you for watching, my viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who's helped me out whatsoever. It is much appreciated. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.